Hey everybody! Uh, apparently we're live. It is good to see you all. This is Adam Savage in my cave, and this is my first live stream since June 22nd. Two, yeah, two plus months. Yeah, beginning of July, beginning of last week. Yeah, two plus months. Um, hi everybody, it's been a bit, <laughs> it's been busy. Um, and yeah, busy for the, busy for the first time in a, busy for the first time in 18 months. And that's been fascinating. So, um, hi, it's been a while since I've done a live stream. Uh, the reason is I spent uh, pretty much the entire month of July on a single build here in the cave. A one day build that was a 30 plus day build. Uh, a really, really fun, big swing. Um, I uh, It kicked my butt, this build but it was lovely to get to sink my teeth into and wrap my arms around, choose your metaphor for embracing um, a single build. I'm gonna give you one hint about the build and it won't reveal anything about the overall structure, but it should give you an idea of the category. There we go, yep. That is part of this build. Um, with some hand machine pieces that I'm very happy with, uh, nested inner and outer acrylic domes, which is a very non-trivial operation. You, we had we had domes uh, blow molded by a company that got it mostly right. Uh, we managed to get uh, yeah. So you got to take something like this. Then you got to cut it on an angle and make sure that the spacing between both of the rings is identical uh, and that you can, yeah, it was a whole thing. We're going to have a crap ton of terrific content on Tested about this build. We're going to cover it in really great detail. Um, I'm excited for you guys to get to see it. And it's also, you know, COVID was the, the time of COVID. Uh, yeah, I came in here and shot everything on the phone for uh, the, a year plus, and that was so healing in so many ways. Uh, and coming out of it this spring, uh, you know, as we started to 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 rise slightly out of the mire, uh, I started wanting to do uh, deeper builds, you know, and that's definitely informed by how it felt to make the Samaritan last year. That, that build was, it, it's just a very different feeling to do one that takes a bunch of time and a whole bunch of different iterative, iterative processes to bring to fruition as opposed to something you can do in two days. I love the something you can do in two days, but man, it's nice to, to do some bigger stuff. Um, we have some questions from you guys. I have some things to show and tell, and uh, yeah, let's get to the questions. Right, so among the other things that have happened is uh, the cons have started up again. I went to MegaCon, an awesome con, uh, uh, down in Orlando and Washington, D.C. I signed autographs for uh, hundreds of fans, took, uh, took photos with hundreds of fans. That was delightful. Um, I have continued to test negative for COVID. I am uh, being very rigorous with mass technique. Um, we're using plexiglass in the photo ops and I'm being rap I'm rapid testing every time I enter and every uh, on both sides of every travel. Yeah. Um, so uh, C2 Lawson, hello again, uh, says, what was it like going to conventions and interacting with the public after a long break? Um, it's fascinating. First of all, I, I don't know about you guys, but every waiter I've had for the past couple of months has wanted to tell me their life story, which is great. Like, we're all so hungry to talk to each other. Uh, and that is really clear in the autograph sessions. As people come up and, and talk to me about their stories and talk to me about uh, what we did on Tested and what it meant to them over COVID. Um, some people wanted to talk about the book. A lot of people wanted to talk about Mythbusters again. I mean, at this point now, a bunch of PhD professors uh, were all coming up and asking for autographs and saying, yeah, I'm an astrophysics professor and I got interested in science because of watching you and Jamie blow stuff up. Uh, that was lovely. Um, I also, in, at uh, MegaCon, Awesome Con and uh, this past weekend at Silicon, the, the con I am the creative director of in San Jose, uh, I did three panels. I did a panel at each and spoke to crowds of, I think, between uh, 500, 
I think the smallest crowd was about like seven or 800 and the largest one was 12 or 1300. I'm bad about estimating, but those are my rough guesses. And it is lovely to have that crowd interaction again. Uh, I, I tell stories in lots of different media, on this media, on television, on stage. Uh, and the stage one is one I haven't been you know, able to do in so long. So it's lovely to have that audience interaction from the stage and also um, very different. Um, look, is when, you're a, when you're a performer, you get used to certain ways of doing your craft. Uh, and then sometimes, you know, you get used to learning new ways to do your craft. Uh, so you go up as a stage performer in front of an unfriendly audience that pushes you in certain directions. A super friendly audience also pushes you in certain directions. What I noticed from the three panels that I've done at the cons is that I, I feel a, still a little bit of a reticence, uh, of a little bit of protection. I, I, all I can say is just that there's a way in which I think that all of us are still feeling a little uncertain about the future. And that translates from the crowd. I can feel like a, a little bit of dampening in the overall energy. And that's totally to be expected. I feel it too. Um, the, 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 the role for me as a performer is to really connect with that and, and not to try and push it away or push it in some different direction, but just respond to it. Uh, and that's been lovely. I did have a, uh, 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 an incredible personal highlight in Orlando, a young man named Noah, uh, dressed as Mando, season one Mando, in a terrific costume, came up to my autograph booth and said, uh, you got me started in making stuff and you specifically got me started uh, by talking about cardboard as the gateway drug to making. And he wanted to show me the, the first piece of, uh, that he had made out of cardboard that sort of showed him what he could do. He wanted to, he brought this thing to show me. And I just want to show you a picture of him at my, at my, uh, at my autograph thing. So here we go. I'm going to hold this up for you there. Ooh, 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 there. Ooh. Can we, uh, we can't focus. No, can no we? Autofocus. What? No autofocus. We're going to post this up on test. This little interaction between me and Noah. Um, it's this beautiful star Lord pistol that he made out of, uh, out of cardboard. And then reader, he gave it to me for my collection. And I love this. I love this. This is his talisman. This, uh, frankly, I don't think it's going too far. One of the things I said when I finished the Hellboy Samaritan was it showed me how to peek above the clouds of my machining skills. And Noah in bringing this and giving to me saying the exact same thing. And this is what it is to, to, to be a maker of anything, to be creative at anything. It is a is it, a, it is a set of, uh, of steps. Um, Chaim Potok has a book called The Book of Lights and the lights that he describes are specifically a, a metaphor, I think built within the Talmud about, uh, about spiritual awakening, about being awake to the spiritual teachings. Um, and I think of making as the same way, as a set of steps. So while it might seem to be a vast difference between this cardboard model and my hand-machined aluminum Samaritan model, I don't see much of a difference between the two things. They both exemplify um, a stage, a phase shift in the maker, and I find that really beautiful. Um, let's see. Uh, Mechanics FX Workshop says, hey, I'm the Mandalorian that put his head through the plexiglass in Florida so you could sign my helmet. A different Mandalorian in Florida. Um, you told me you received the materials to finish off details for your Mando suit. I have, yes. Uh, what is a good beginner lathe to purchase to get started since I'd like to build onto this suit until I overhaul a whole better version? Oh, beginner lathe. <sighs> that is a tricky one. Um, I, yeah, if you have not used a lathe before, it is not too far to say, you know, look on Craigslist for a benchtop lathe. They show up from time to time. Um, Compact, C-O-M-P-A-C is a European company that, uh, Compact 5 is the, is the uh, small hobby lathe, not super cheap. I mean, like over, even, uh, over, even used, it's worth a few hundred bucks. Um, but really highly precise right out of the box, and that makes a big difference. Um, but if you're a beginner, if you haven't used a lathe before, 
I'm going to say just get the lathe you can afford right now. And when you hate that lathe enough because you understand what it can't do for you, then you have built enough knowledge to go out and get a better lathe. Um, I'm sorry, I'm not across um, low cost beginner lathes right now and the landscape of that. Um, but that is in general always my tool advice. Buy the, buy the one you can afford right now. If you don't know how to use it, learn how to use it on that one. Read forums of people using that. I mean, actually, I do have one piece of advice is go to the Practical Machinist Forum and other home machinist forums and look at what they recommend for beginner lathes because they'll also be a font of information and knowledge about ways to get those beginner lathes to work for you. For instance, like those Atlas three in ones, those are great machines if you are a talented and competent machinist, but you have to be one to make those machines sing. Those are the machines that are lathe, mill, combo. They can do incredible stuff, but you do need a certain base level of competence in order to kind of whip them into shape. Um, Let's see. Uh, Clinton Anderson says, we hear and see that you're doing well, especially as COVID-19 times resolve. And then he says, they are resolving, right? Yeah, your guess is as good as mine. How about Mrs. Don't Try This and the younger Don't Try This? Is, is everybody good? I'm up north at my in-laws college, surrounded by family for the first time in months and months, so I'm feeling a little feelsy. Yeah. Um, I just got together with uh, Thing 1 and Thing 2 in Cape Cod with my mom, who you have seen on the channel. Uh, we all, Mrs. Don't Try This, our sons and my mom, all uh, arrived in Cape Cod uh, and spent two weeks uh, hanging out at our house there uh, east of Falmouth. And it was lovely. It was intense, like family times can often be. Um, but it was really nice to see everybody. Every one of us was rapid tested uh, before we all got together, which was a nice way to feel super confident and super uh, at ease with each other. Um, well, yeah, uh, everybody is healthy. That Thank you so much for asking. That is also my first question with everybody. The, the, the mail delivery, the UPS driver, you know, the person behind the counter, that's all. When someone says, how you doing? I say, great, how are you? Your family, everyone's good, you know? It's, I, there is such a cultural difference across cultures about the phrase, how are you? Uh, and the Australians that I've worked with are always shocked that Americans want to give an actual answer to that. Like, yeah, I'm okay. <laughs> um, but one thing that's happening right now I notice is that every time someone says, how are you? You get a real response. And I like that. I think that's, that, that's a connection that we, that we all can use. Um, Let's see. Uh, yeah, thank you, uh, Clinton, for asking and inquiring after after the family. Yeah, my uh, it was great. We kayaked every day in Cape Cod. It was beautiful. We watched the osprey hunting at sunset. Oh man, osprey! I go through different raptor phases, but osprey are currently one of my favorite raptors. But I, is there something about getting into your 50s and being interested in watching birds? I don't know what it is, but like it's happened to me and Mrs. Don't Try This and to many of our friends, bird watching has, has created great succor and distraction during these times. Um, Kenny Tate says, how has it felt seeing so many things you helped create from Mythbusters find new homes through the auction? Uh, it must feel good knowing it's for a good cause, but also sad knowing you might not ever see some of them again. Uh, at the same time, someone will get the joy of having something you brought into being in their collection. Um, note, tomorrow, September 1st, is the very last day of Prop Store's auction of Mythbuster props to, ben to benefit the Grant Imahara Steam Foundation. Uh, September 1st is the final day of the auction. Um, you can buy blueprints. You can buy some small things from Mythbusters. Hell, you can bid on RoboShark if you want. There are already bids on RoboShark. I am so psyched to know where RoboShark is going to go. Um, Kenny, I don't feel sad knowing that I might not see some of these things again. I mean, I only have so much room in my life for all the things that I have built. I wish I had more, but also I don't wish I had more. In fact, currently I'm going through a stage of wishing I had less. Um, but you are right. It is freaking delightful to think about these pieces that we built that were part of our narrative storytelling process, going into other people's homes to be celebrated and talked about 
and to be connection points. I love all the blueprints uh, uh, going up for sale. There's so much history in them. Uh, and frankly, I think I'll see many of these props again, because as I move around the world, I'm sure anyone that owns owns one of these pieces is gonna come out from the woodwork and say, hey, would you sign this, sign this blueprint for me again? Or come take a look at the RoboShark on top of my bar. That is my fantasy is that RoboShark will RoboShark will live out the rest of his life animated on top of some surf bar. Listening to me, people? Come on, get RoboShark. I'm so, so psyched about RoboShark living somewhere. Um, and maybe whoever gets RoboShark should also win the bid for Grant Imahara's horrifying zombie cat. Like, don't you think that those two should go together? Or maybe like the animated sign of a bar where RoboShark is like <laughs> chasing after RoboCat. That would be amazing. All right, I'm done solving your problems for you, uh, who will, random bar owner and fictional bar owner in my head who might buy both of these props. Um, Gabe Russell uh, has said, it's been great to hear about uh, my experiences as a younger artist in San Francisco and how has that scene evolved? What are my thoughts on living in San Francisco as a young artist versus now? Oh, wow. Um, that is an interesting question because I don't exactly know. It has been a long time since I've sort of played around in the art scene of San Francisco. I mean, I, I will say that San Francisco, the population of San Francisco contracted somewhere between 10 and 15% um, over the past 18 months. And I can feel that contraction moving around the city. I can feel how the city is a little bit lighter on its feet. There's just a little less traffic everywhere, a um, little less street traffic. And part of that is also COVID and Delta, et cetera. Um, but that lightness of the city, the, the slightly lower population, it definitely feels a lot more like the 90s now than it used to. Uh, and I like that. Um, but I am not sure I have enough of a point of view about what it's like to be a young artist in San Francisco right now because I just don't know the gallery scene, you know? Uh, back when I was first here, uh, 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 a friend of mine named Brett opened up a gallery on um, Divisadero, uh, I think next door or one door down from Comics Experience, uh, which is still there, God bless those guys, um, called Art Attack, an Art Attack gallery. I did five or six shows there. Nelson Morales had a gallery downtown and put me in some group shows. There was a, um, a hilarious, weird fever dream of an art bar on Hayes Street in Hayes Valley between Laguna and Octavia called Art... Uh, Espas, espas. <laughs> um, if you've ever, Espas was run by this crazy group of French people who I really dug. They gave me my very first one person sculpture show and I'll forever be grateful. They were really awesome and weird to deal with. And they reminded me of something. Like as I dealt with the French people at Espas in the early 90s, they reminded me of something. And then I found out that the lead owner, who was really like a like a wacky, like a, a version of a wacky Frenchman from your head, turned out to be the inspiration for the bank robber from the movie Killing Zoe. So Killing Zoe is this heist film starring Eric Stoltz and Julie Delpy if I remember correctly. And it involves Eric Stoltz's character helping a bunch of crazy French people to rob a bank. And one of those crazy French people and Eric Stoltz go out partying. And the French guy says to him something like, the robbery is tomorrow, tonight, we live life. And like totally insane character. Apparently that character was based on the owner of his boss. And as soon as I heard that, I'm like, this all makes complete sense. These wonderfully loopy French people running this gallery that gave me a show, being around them is like being in a movie. Um, so yeah, there's another story about my early times in San Francisco. But uh, I, you know, I'll tell you one of the things I really liked about the art scene back then. And you know, maybe in the comments, young artists in San Francisco can tell me in comparison what it's like now, is that it was fairly easy to get your work into a group show back in the early 90s. And by easy, I mean, you still had to hustle. You still needed to bring your slides and your, your work out and show that to a lot of different people. You needed to pay attention to what shows were coming in. You needed to go out on the gallery nights and do the walk and go to the openings and see who was in town. 
Um, I mean, everybody is their own kind of artist, but the people at the at a high level of any discipline, everyone is obsessed with everything that's going on in that field. Uh, and in San Francisco in the early 90s, that that base level scene of sort of the entry level gallery scene was a very vibrant and fun scene. Um, and getting your work into a lot of group shows is a really useful thing for young artists. You get feedback, you get iterative feedback. People follow your work, they make comments on it and those comments can really help you contextualize that work for yourself. Um, in New York, in contrast, in the late 80s, uh, I remember there being like one or two places you could show your work as a beginning artist. And I mean, one of them was a place called White Columns where I think it was 18 months to get an appointment to get your slides looked at back when I left New York. Um, and to be fair, you know, New York is its own kind of city with its own kind of culture and uh, the, the threshold to entry is higher than it is in San Francisco. And I think the same with LA, the threshold to entry uh, is higher. However, I think that San Francisco's lower threshold to entry is what engendered so much exploration for me as a young, as a young maker. Gabe, I've done everything but answer your question, but I still hope that some of my answer was useful. Um, let's see. August McKenna says that I, she says, first order retrievability as your organizational philosophy um, uh, she says she she's pointing out that I use it, first order retrievability, yes. And for the uninitiated, first order retrievability is my shop philosophy that I want all of my mission critical tools at my at a reach so that I don't have to like open a drawer to go get a critical tool. I can just reach out and grab it. And August says, uh, pegboard would seem to be a great first order retrievability system, but they haven't seen it in my shop. Why? That is a great question. Actually, for me, it's because I don't have a lot of wall space. Wall space is always at a premium in the shops that I have had. If I had a shop with a big blank wall, I might very well make outlines of all sorts of hand tools and put them up on that wall. Nothing would make me happier, but space is at such a premium in this place. And again, for reference, it's I think 30 feet this way and probably about 15 feet this way. Yeah, um, it's like 500 square feet. This is a, a very small little space. Um, I don't mind pegboard. I love pegboard. I do have one issue with pegboard in that um, if I was going to do pegboard, I would find the places for all the hooks and then I would secure the hooks into the pegboard. I don't like pulling things off pegboard and having the hook come with me, it makes me crazy. Uh, so, nothing personally against pegboard. It's a personal space issue. Let's see. <laughs> Sorry, this is funny. The Highlander, with, an, with a Y, the Highlander says, which is stronger? The high from having the perfect tool for the job or the low from knowing there is a perfect tool for the job and you don't have it and thus you're spending twice the time or effort to complete the job? That is a great question. So the high of having the perfect tool of like, mm, I need to get this thing out of this thing and then you reach over and you're like, thank goodness I have my nine inch long alligator grabbers so I can put them all inside the oop and grab the thing and pull it out. Oh my God, it's the perfect tool. This is awesome. I am awesome for buying this and remembering where it was. There is that, that is definitely a high. Then there is the, all I wanna do is spread this giant circlip open to get it off this damn thing. And when you have to spread a circlip, a big, powerful, strong one, and you don't have the right circlip spreader, I have like custom ground the jaws of a cheap pair of pliers to do this and sat there for like an hour knowing that if I had the right, I'm gonna say that the low of not having the right tool is worse is, is way, but which is stronger? Yeah, the low is stronger than the high. And it's also because human beings, we tend to deprioritize the highs. We tend to, right? We tend to like have a nice experience. I'm like, that was great. Okay, what can I get mad about now? <laughs> yeah, uh, I mean, and that's, that's part of that like 
bias we have as people that makes us always think that all the other lanes are going faster than us. It's because we don't remember when we're in the lane going faster. We just remember the pain of not being in the right lane while all the other lanes are going past us. Uh, and that's been proven experimentally. So the low of not having the right tool, yeah, it's way worse. Um, I did have one experience on a, was it a Jetta? I think it was a Jetta. Um, for non-Volkswagen owners, my experience with Volkswagens is they have all the same car parts as other cars, except that Volkswagen likes to design them in a way that is twice as complex and hard to fix. I swear to God, if your window breaks on a Volkswagen, just like your car is totaled. So I, I know there's people nodding along with me right now. I bought a Jetta with two broken windows and the, fa the, the shop estimate for fixing them was over 1200 bucks for two windows that didn't roll up and down. And that's because that Jetta had this whole cable return system instead of the lever arm we've been using since the 40s. Okay. <laughs> Where was I? Volkswagen Jettas. Sorry, I got I got so upset about Volkswagens that I lost my train of thought. Let's move on to the next question, shall we? Oh, oh, here we go. Uh, how X Camer asks, how has the interest been for the prop store Mythbusters auction? Dude, it's been amazing. Uh, it's been incredible. Uh, the uh, amount of signups of new accounts at Prop Store's website, and you can go there, propstore.com slash tested, uh, to sign up. The new signups they've had exceeds the number of signups they've ever had for an auction in the past. Yeah, and uh, we had in our heads, the Grant and Mahara Steam Foundation and me and various people interested had a number in our heads as to like, you know, it would be really nice if we hit this number. Um, we're already way past that. And it's so gratifying. The interest has been um, super enthusiastic. It's been very gratifying. Uh, doing each of the videos on the pieces that were in the auction, on the shark, on the cat, on the, the Newton's cradle, um, that was really cathartic for me and delightful, both to talk about the pieces that we made and also go back through some of those shooting days and think about my colleagues and reminisce and roll back over all those lovely memories of making the show. Um, the interest has been incredibly gratifying. Um, and we're going to raise a lot of money for the Grant Imahara Steam Foundation. And the Grant Imahara Steam Foundation is going to do a lot of good in the world with that dough. And I'm freaking delighted and grateful to be part of that, part of that process. Um, Salgado 3D Builds says, how heavy is the Mark I that you wore at Silicon? Surprisingly light, in fact. Uh, that Mark I is... All of its main pieces are slush cast onyx. <coughs> onyx is a uh, urethane resin with a thick body. So when you slush cast it, it molds uh, dimensionally. Like normal Instacast, you might get something like 20 thou on a first pour, but onyx goes more to like probably 60 or 70 thou. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. One of the issues with that multiple pours of onyx, though, is that the layers don't often stick to each other. So there are parts of my Iron Man that when they crack, they shatter like potato chips and separate. So I had to do some real structural work on the inside. However, you asked how heavy it was. Uh, and the answer, I think, is well under 20 pounds. I think it's like 17 pounds for the whole thing. Yeah. Um, most of that poundage sits right here. And I will tell you, I, I walked the floor for about an hour on Saturday. Uh, I ended up chafing off so much skin off the inside of my left knee that I asked for a dolly and we found one. So I got wheeled off of the floor, <laughs> which felt luxurious. Um, and yeah, the next day, Sunday and Monday, I took ibuprofen, a bunch of ibuprofen because I felt that weight right here, man. Um, yeah, it is hard to carry, like, look, feeling sore from your costume is part of cosplay. So even though uh, my Iron Man Mark I is super light, it's still, it still made me sore. Um, all right, let's see here. Uh, how, uh, Craig Jacobs says, how is your one wheel holding up? Really well, thank you. 
I love it. Um, a friend of mine has been riding one of those unicycles, the kind you ride like the character from the comic BC. I know, a deep cut from long ago. Um, and I, I've i never liked the stance on those unicycles, but um, I've been really interested in the one he has because it's got like air shocks and a big headlight. And, you know, I, so I may delve into the unicycle thing as well. I, 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 I love... I love easy, quick transport like that, um, you know, and I get I get transport curious here and there, but the one wheel still remains like one of the great relaxation techniques for me. Um, I love, you know, on a Sunday afternoon, at like four o'clock, it's getting quiet. Uh, I'll jump on the one wheel and just ride through parts of the city I haven't been to in a while. And because it's the one wheel and because I'm like, you know, mostly taking bicycle lanes, I also take like lots of little alleyways I wouldn't necessarily take in a car or sometimes even on a bicycle. Um, riding along the waterfront, it's always really thrilling and neat. You get to see pieces of the city that you don't see. And because it's silent, frankly, it just feels like flying all the time. Uh, let's see, JPL4185 asks, Wondering if you've gotten any non-costume related use out of your 3D printers yet. Um, any fun models or helpful stuff for use around the shop? No. Which is, in point of fact, crazy. I was just thinking about ordering some more of the containers for my Sordimo boxes. And I, and I was like looking on Amazon last night to order a set of new little, um, sorry, let, let me just be really clear. So my primary mode of organization here in the shop are these boxes called Sortimo, and they have in them these uh, separators, but the separators are modular and they register. Um, yeah, it's a brilliant system so that when you close it up, even though there's all these separate things, they don't cross pollinate. But like I have over 50 of these things um, and, you know, I don't have a perfect distribution of the little ones, twos, threes, and fours uh, containers. So I need some other ones. And it's like, you go and you buy a full set of them and some of them are useful to you and some of them aren't. And it only occurred to me late last night, there's gotta be an STL of these things. Or I could build one, it's not that complex. And then I should be printing these up on the form 3L, yeah. Um, all of that's the longest way of saying, no, I haven't. And I think that's a deficit. I think I've been underutilizing my 3D printer of late. Um, I'm also getting ready for some Ghostbusters. Ghostbusters Afterlife comes out later on this year. We're gonna have some content showing up on Tested very soon. This, this week? Tomorrow. Tomorrow, tomorrow, says Norm. Uh, we are releasing the first of the tons of content we made uh, visiting the set of Ghostbusters Afterlife, talking to various members of the crew, including the director, Jason Reitman. Um, oh my God, I'm so excited, excited for everyone to see this beautiful movie. Uh, and I'm excited to get my full Ghostbusters trooping set up, refined and ready to go uh, to help support this film. Uh, so I'm going to be using the 3D printer for some of those parts very, very soon. Um, Ah, Laura Hertzman asks, hi, she notices uh, that I'm not wearing my tennis elbow brace and am I feeling better? Yes, I am, thank you so much. See, there's something about this. It is a real conversation and I genuinely appreciate it. Thank you, Laura, for asking. <laughs> um, Um, Gavin Oxious G says, his name is Gavin and he's working on a drone that he's building from scratch. I'm just assuming it's a he, Gavin, sounds like a masculine name. Uh, do you have any tips on 3D printing and designing from nothing? The only tip I have is that the first one's gonna suck. It's gonna suck. It may work just fine and you may use it for a while, but recognize that even if it doesn't suck in the moment, when you make version two and then version three, you're gonna go back and look at version one and being like, wow, that sucked. It's just, it's a process. So my advice for starting from nothing is go gently and realize that you're not gonna just learn how to build the thing right. 
you're going to learn how to build it. And then you're going to have a point of view on what right is. Because that's okay. That's actually, that's a really nice refinement of the way I talk about this. Before you build something, before you know how to build a drone, you might think in your head that there's a right way to do it. And so you're trying to read all the forums and read other people who have built them and watch their YouTube videos and sort of gather the information you need to, on how the right way to build it is. And what you're going to find is that there's tons of stuff in that kind of research that doesn't resolve. Different people have different opinions about what the right way to build something is. So you're never going to come to an answer about the right way, just as you're never going to come up with an answer as to how to make the perfect cup of coffee. There's too many different opinions about that. What you have to do is make one for yourself and then you will start to have opinions about who's right and who's wrong to you. They're not right and wrong in some objective way. They're right and wrong given your point of view about how you want to build something. So recognize that the process of learning how to build something right is the process of figuring out what your point of view is on the situation. And as you build this drone from scratch, you're gonna have things that you want out of that drone, that you want it to do, that you want the experience to be like. And that's what you should be chasing. Don't worry if someone else says that the thing you're interested in isn't important. They don't matter in your build. I mean, they might live rent free in your head, but you're just gonna have to deal with that. Um, I hope that is useful. One of the other things I tell people embarking on building something for the first time is get ready to build it three times. With just put yourself into the frame of mind that the first one's going to be bad and the second one's going to be bad and the third one's going to be acceptable. If you put yourself in that frame of mind, then you will be less inclined to get hard on yourself in the process when the first one's bad and you're like, man, it took all this time and it's bad. Just wrap your head around the fact that your first iteration is going to be clunky, rough around the edges. It's, it's a process. Um, God, these questions are terrific. Okay, here we got one last question. This one is from Frankly Built. It says, you've addressed 3D printing in relation to cosplaying and making in the past, i.e. gatekeepers who don't like change. Uh, he's referring to the fact that at least for a while, I hope not anymore, 3D printing was like a lot of people in the cosplay community were thinking of 3D printing and other rapid prototyping technologies as cheating. What a boring argument. Anyway, uh, is there another medium in making that went through similar growing pains? Yeah, I mean, I, look, every, every time a technology makes something easier, there's going to be growing pains. Um, so my example that I love to give is graphic design. And I learned graphic design in New York in the mid 80s, the era just before computers. So in order to get really nice type, you either had to write it all out, exactly the font, exactly the size, exactly the line spacing and the kerning that you wanted. And then you had to order it from a special film printer called a Sertronics printer. I think that was what it was. And there was like one guy who operated this machine who typed out your stuff, it printed it out in film paper. You took that, attached it to your cardboard blue line, and that was the master for the printer. I mean, it was laborious. There is no better training for being able to look at composition than physical graphic design like that. I mean, I'm sorry. I hate it when people gatekeep by saying there is no better blah, blah, blah. For me, in my design head, there was no, there, it was a fantastic training ground to learn how to lay text and type out on a physical board and to look and make sure it was balanced and right. And then in the 90s, computers came and instead of doing this physically on a board, we started doing it on a screen. And the first thing I noticed with graphic designers on the computer is that I frequently had to take a piece of paper in order to figure out a graphic. And I kind of had to sort of, I sort of had to like lay out what I thought were the, the main forms of my graphic design. And I might make a first sketch that is as rough as no this. Oh, no autofocus. I'm so sorry. A rough sketch of the pieces of the graphic design and just look at the layout and kind of balance it. And I still have to do that despite using a computer because there's a way in which the physical thing and the way it operates allows me to see it in a way that I can just not see on a screen. So 
physical rendering of the thing is still a key part of my graphic process. But you were asking about gatekeeping. So I will say that, yeah, the early 90s were a really weird time for graphic design. You had uh, magazines like Mondo 2000 and some of the early days of Wired where they were like, hey, we have all the fonts, let's use them. And what came out of that was a was a graphic horror show where people would do things like red text on a black background in a magazine I bought at the store and could barely read without feeling like my eyes were falling out of my face. Those were growing pains. Uh, and then there were graphic designers who were like, it's not graphic design if it's done on a computer. And of course it was. Um, what I'm dealing with now as a graphic designer is that the software I learned on, which is Cork Express, Cork was built for my generation of graphic designers. It was built for people who think physically in terms of these blue lines. It was just, that was the transition. The people that built that program came from that lineage. Adobe InDesign does not come from that lineage. It comes from its own lineage of all computer-aided design. And in that regard, I don't understand Adobe InDesign. I mean, I get what it can do and I can use it, but I don't understand it. Like there's a, literally a mental frame that it takes that I have to kind of wrap my head around every single time. Um, every technology is going to bring its versions of gatekeeping, rough patches while the design catches up. Um, computer aided effects in film have also gone through the same weird zone. Um, Jurassic Park still holds up and as good as is as good as anything going today. But shortly after Jurassic Park came out, I mean, we were saddled with all sorts of movies with terrible CG. And often it was terrible because the budgets were so low, they were just rendering it once and printing that and sending that out to, to, to be projected where you really want to take time to refine your, your, your renders and make sure that they are working. Um, yeah, every, every technology is going to bring with it uh, the same things, gatekeeping, rough transitions, uh, and then, you know, the world is going to adopt that technology into its mental palace. And now there are things you can do gra from a graphic design standpoint that you could have never even imagined from a physical stat machine film printing, uh, film printing standpoint. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Frankly, Bill. Yeah, it's a big subject. Um, I, I want to finish this broadcast. Uh, we are saying goodbye, but not, sorry, we're, how do you saying? Say au revoir, but not goodbye. We are wishing happy trails to Gunther Kirsch, who has been with Tested nigh on five years, almost five, six, five, five years plus. Gunther has been shooting for us and editing for us. We have spent countless hours he has spent countless hours in the shop watching me get salty on camera when things don't go the way I want them to. Um, Gunther is... Hello. There he is. They told me to come over here. Ladies and gentlemen, Gunther Kirsch. Come in, sir. Hello. Gunther is moving on to explore freelance world. Yep. Good luck, buddy. Thank you. What's next? What's next? What's next? Uh, you know, just taking it one step at a time. I have some freelance gigs here and there, and then it's just a matter of keeping the ball rolling and keeping that ball rolling and not losing sleep. So yeah. Excellent. This is this is officially Gunther's last day. So wish your well wishes to Gunther. And uh, if you need a cameraman editor in the North Bay, you can find him. Dude, best of luck to yeah, you. Yeah, it was, it was fun, man. Thank you. Pleasure. There'll be more times too. I am sure there will be more times. Yeah, we've traveled around the world together, haven't yeah, we? Literally, yeah. Absolutely. All right, everybody, this is Adam Savage. I am signing off of this live stream. Thank you guys so much for joining me, Gunther. Thank you so much Thanks, for Adam. all these years of hard work. Absolutely. Excellent. More to come. All right, guys. Peace out. Be safe. Bye bye.